Jason Child, uh, and I teach music at the Emerson Waldorf School in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I work with first graders up through 12th graders, um, doing general music classes, chorus and band. And I'm just one of the music faculty also. We have a whole team that works together there. I also work on the Leadership Council of OSNA, uh, which is how I got connected with this school. And when uh, the school was looking for some advice and some work on their music program, they asked if I would come, so here I am. In some ways, music stitches together the day for the children. And if you watch a Waldorf teacher, they'll be you know, singing through the transitions and the children just know what to do because, oh, it's this song. It must be time to move in this direction. Um, so it's a part of the life of a Waldorf student. But that's only one aspect of it. It's also one of the activities. It's kind of a core subject in the Waldorf schools. And it's there, actually all of the subjects that we teach in the Waldorf school are there because they're important subjects, but also because they develop something for the child that's really critical at a given age. So when music becomes a subject in a Waldorf school, it's there because it's going to uncover some capacities that are really important for life. So in the middle school years, in the beginning of adolescence, coming together in an ensemble with peers and having to cooperate and having to contribute, but contribute in the right way. It, these are lessons that they learn for life. And you know, not all Waldorf graduates become musicians, but they become musical people. And the things that you learn from music become really critical um, to be a really functional, healthy adult. A kindergarten teacher, early childhood teacher knows that they can sing and the group becomes the chorus. We are cleaning up, we are lining up, and nobody has to say, time to line up, time to clean up. So it, it's a way to, to sort of band the group together you know, through feeling. And, and uh, it just becomes just a natural part of their day, these songs. So that's, that's in the early childhood, the teachers use that and, and it creates we like to use the word rhythm, and you think of musical rhythm, but create sort of a rhythm to their lives and to the day. That there are times that they're singing in a certain activity, and then those are repeated day after day in the same way, the same song. So there's a rhythm to the way the Waldorf School Day unfolds. The way we look at children uh, is that during certain years of their life, what they will naturally develop are habits. And so our task as Waldorf teachers is to help them to develop the right habits. And if the habits are um, good math uh, facts or good spelling or good writing, those are great habits for life. And if you can develop them as habits, then you win. <laughs> you take advantage of what children naturally do and you've educated them. So working in a repetitious way is how you develop habits. So Waldorf teachers do that. They, they work uh, in repetition to help develop habits that are really the learning that has to happen in school. And so the children do things. You'll see if you walk into a classroom, you'll see them jumping rope or bouncing balls, but all the while learning uh, math facts or learning how to spell words. And it just is approached naturally. It's not painful to them because this is what children do anyway. Anyone who has children know that you can never anticipate what's going to happen on any given day. And so rhythm in music is flexible. It changes, but there's a certain beat that underlies it. So the rhythm is, uh, you can anticipate what it's going to do. It comes and goes. It's usually pretty predictable, but it sticks to a beat but it's somewhat flexible. So it's, it's a word we like because it's not as rigid as we will have a routine and it will follow in this certain way. So uh, Waldorf teachers often talk about rhythm when they're working with children. Think about what children like to do. They like to hear stories. They like to draw pictures. They like to sing songs, hopefully, if they're healthy, sort of normal children. These are activities that children do. And Waldorf teachers try to take advantage of that. They know that there's something working in the young child. There's something at work there that, that makes them want to draw pictures and want to listen to stories. Even adults love to listen to stories and makes them want to sing. And so we try to take advantage of that in the education. Um, if they're naturally interested in stories, naturally interested in pictures, there's something about the child that, that makes them that way, then we can present what we want to teach as stories, as pictures, and it 
sort of potentializes what we are trying to do. So that's a little bit of why music. I mean, it's it's in the grade school, then uh, as music becomes a subject, and when I say grade school, I'm thinking grades one through eight. So um, as it becomes a subject, we sort of start with the young child. And you think, uh, if you can imagine music just kind of sort of welling up out of the child and, and they can sing. And if you go into if a kindergarten or a first grade, I mean, the voices are beautiful. They just sing these beautiful songs in a beautiful way. And that's their first instrument and their first experience of music. The next thing that we try to do is give them a flute. And it's a special kind of flute that really can be played in a certain way that forces the child to really play with this beautiful open mouth. So it's almost as if their singing voice is extended outward and projected into this instrument. So they, the music sort of becomes a little bit more external to the child. It's still the child's own experience but we're sort of moving it outward into this flute. And then they have to actually develop some skills to play the thing. You have to hold it the right way and cover the holes in the right way. And that's sort of a picture of what happens in Waldorf education. Take what's in the child, what's naturally growing there, and then draw it out in the way that it can just really flourish. So it starts there. You're singing, you get this first flute where you're drawing out and playing, and from there you can go on. The singing can grow into singing in parts, singing in a chorus, doing some really challenging things. The flute can grow into eventually moving into a string instrument where you have your own part. You know, with flutes, we all play the same flute, but when you get into fourth grade or third grade, whenever strings has started, then you have your own part. And of course, that's developmental, and that's for a reason. That's an age when the child developmentally becomes aware, oh, I'm my own person. I'm really separate from my mom and dad and from the environment. And sometimes even the children are a little sad at that age. And then we give them these string instruments. Here's your part, and you'll contribute to the whole group. Competition is valuable if you're competing with yourself, if you're really trying to set a goal, and can I meet that goal? So, you know, your own internal competition, that's really healthy. Uh, and we try to help the children do that. If you watch a grades teacher, you know, in the, in the grade school, they'll challenge each individual student to look at the work and say, is this your best work? When it comes to working with other people, it's got to be collaboration. And that's something that uh, is important to us. Uh, and I think it's important for the future. And if you look at the direction that really the corporate world, in a way, is going, it's highly collaborative. Those are where successful companies, that's what they do, is they look for employees that can collaborate. And I have a friend who uh, works for a big uh, microchip company, and a uh, pretty well-known company, and he was teaching computer science. And he realized the students that were coming to him in his undergraduate classes couldn't think. And he didn't know what to do with them. There's nothing that he could do with students that just didn't know how to think. They knew how to um, take direction and, and do the next step. But they didn't know what to do if the next step wasn't clear. And so his kids are at the Waldorf School. And even though he's working in high tech, I mean really at the top of his game in high tech, he wants his kids to be at the Waldorf School because he knows that the top of the game in any company, whether it's high tech or anything, has to do with can you think? And back to can you collaborate? Can you communicate? If you can't do those things, it doesn't matter what your performance is on the standardized test or how much you know. It's how you think. The destination is important. Children need to graduate from school with certain skills, certain knowledge, hopefully basic human capacities having been developed. Um, the destination is important, but how do you want to get there? And sometimes people look at Waldorf schools and they say, what, you mean they're not starting with the, read, the sight reading words in first grade? Which, of course, there are a lot of myths around reading in Waldorf schools, but uh, they're not approaching uh, the, these subjects in the standard way? That doesn't seem responsible. But we just have a different route. But we get to the destination. And one of the things I always like to do is, um, at our high school, take our SAT scores and just average them out over the years and compare them to other schools. We have top-notch public schools in, in the 
part of North Carolina where I live. And our students generally do better. They do better than the kids in the private schools. And all the kids that have been in prep school, that have been in the high pressure public school setting, our kids do fine. But they've been on a much more interesting journey. And they've seen a lot more sights and grown a lot more as people along the way. Our approach is child-centered. So we're really looking at where is a child and how can we make the most of where they are to ensure that everything that needs to be grown at a certain age is brought to its full potential. Even just social capacities like compassion or empathy, um, ability to really listen to someone, to really understand a different point of view. These are all things that are, can be developed by carefully allowing what's in the child to sort of blossom. Music can be really goal-oriented. It's about learning an instrument the fastest way possible or getting yourself uh, proficient in a certain way. It's about skills. And at the Waldorf School, music is there not really just because music is wonderful. I mean, we, we like music. It's a big part of the program, but it's also about what it does for the children. And so um, if you walk into a water school, if you've ever even just walked through the doors, you get the sense there's just something that hits you. It's almost like an aura that the place gives off of beauty and of subtlety. And music's another way into that, to really focus the children and help them to really discern what is beautiful and to really become subtly attuned to things. In music, yes. In color and art, yes. And then later on, in social relationships, you know, in their later life, into the subtleties and possibilities of, say, math, or of an insight into science or biology that no one had ever had, because we don't feed them uh, sort of black and white rules. Instead, we ask them to observe and sort of discern what's in their environment. So we create this beautiful environment and music is a big part of it. Asking them to really become discriminating and to discern what they hear and to attune to the beauty of it. So beauty actually has a function in Waldorf education. And if you meet a Waldorf kid, if you've never met a Waldorf kid, you need to go and meet them or better a group of them and just see there's something different. They're sensitive. They're attuned to subtleties in a way that I, I haven't experienced in other school settings that I've worked in. And it's really remarkable. And it, it makes for really mature high school students and young adults. And that's really where the proof is. If you can go and meet a group of Waldorf High School students and have a one-on-one, you can actually have a one-on-one, -on -one, almost adult-to-adult -adult conversation with a Waldorf High School student. And that's not so common in every school. because. They're attuned. <laughs>